Today on the podcast, non-pharmaceutical interventions for dementia in nursing home care. Stick around. Hey out there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Rob. I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we have a tremendous guest, Dr. Helen Kales of UC Davis, uh, talking about non-pharmaceutical approaches to the care of residents in nursing homes that have dementia. It's going to be a great conversation. We talk about um, her initiative, the DICE approach to um, dementia care. Really fantastic. Please stick around for it. It's going to be great. All right, now it's time for your nursing home regulation question of the week. Under 42 USC 483, which positions are required at every nursing home? Is it A, the infection preventionist and director of nursing, B, administrator and assistant administrator, or C, director of nursing and assistant director of nursing? I think this is I think this is easy to medium. So ho- hopefully we're all getting this right. But the answer is every nursing home is required to have a infection preventionist and a director of nursing. So the infection preventionist is in charge of developing the policies and procedures to prevent uh, the spread of infection in the nursing home. And of course, the director of nursing is basically the administrative uh, nurse that kind of is in, also in charge of the policies and procedures of what the nursing staff does. So if you got that. I'm going to say that's a 10 pointer. That's a 10 pointer. All right. And we're still limping along with this particular segment of the podcast, but this is going to be the chat GPT generated nursing home regulation joke of the week. Let us see what Skynet has for us today in terms of humor. The chat GPT generated nursing home regulation joke of the week. Skynet. 48360A says provide dietary needs, so nursing homes are thinking of introducing puree of the day. It's like soup, but with the thrill of guessing what it was. <laughs> that one's okay. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, Skynet is not yet George Carlin. We haven't made it that far yet. So if you're worried about your job, for now, don't be. <laughs> All right, let's get into the substance of the episode. As I mentioned, we are not delving into this topic alone. We have with us an incredible guest, Dr. Helen Kells. Dr. Kells is a fellowship trained, board certified geriatric psychiatrist. She is the chair of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at UC Davis. Dr. Kell is an expert in later life depression outcomes, risk of psychotropic medications in older adults, and dementia care improvement. As the founding director of the University of Michigan's Program for Positive Aging, now at UC Davis, she developed the DICE approach, a globally adopted non-pharmacological strategy for dementia caregivers. And we are so happy to have her here to talk with us today. Dr. Kells, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob, for having me. Um, so I think that w- one of the one of the many complaints that I get from people that have a loved one in a nursing home especially those that have a, a diagnosis of, of dementia, of Alzheimer's, is an issue with whether or not the medication that's being used to treat, in quotation marks, that diagnosis is the, the, the best way or the only way. Uh, can you kind of talk about some approaches to the long-term treatment of dementia that maybe doesn't heavily involve or involve at all the use of pharmaceuticals? Sure, and know that that question is one that the field struggles with as well. Um, And, you know, I think sometimes it's a little bit of an artifact of the organization of our, you know, long-term care Um, it's not long-term care isn't really set up to come up with person-centered solutions at times. And so I want to back up just a second to give the audience a sense of where these behaviors come from. So if you think about the brain and the brain that you and I or the audience have, and then you think about what the difference would be between somebody 
with a normal functioning brain and somebody with a brain with dementia, a lot of that is due to damage in neuro circuits. And we think that behaviors come two ways. One is a direct damage to a neuro circuit. And the symptom of apathy is one where they've kind of shown that the knockout of certain neuro circuits can directly cause apathy. So apathy looks like, you know, the person doesn't care. They don't want to initiate things. They're sort of sitting in their chair and, and just not participating in life. There are other behaviors like we, we commonly hear agitation. And that's one where there could be a thousand different causes, quite honestly. And so you're quite perceptive and the audience is quite perceptive and saying, is medication really the best treatment for something like agitation, which I always liken to, it's kind of like the physical symptom of shortness of breath. We know what shortness of breath is, but it's not a disease. It's a symptom, right? And you could have a pulmonary embolus or you could have a heart attack or you could have, you know, um, congestive heart failure. If we presumptively treated shortness of breath with an antibiotic, we could be missing the right cause in many different cases. And similarly, if we treat agitation with something like an antipsychotic, and let's say agitation is coming because the person has pain, we're missing the boat. So what we really strive to urge is, is to look at symptoms as coming from one of three um, angles in a, in a triangle, which is the person themselves, the caregiver, or the environment. And to unpack that and try to look at what is the underlying cause. And then knowing that underlying cause can really lead you to the investigation of, you know, what's going on and then how to treat it. Does that make sense? It, it does. So, and thank you for, for stepping back because that's, it's going to, at least makes it easy for me to conceptualize what we're talking about. So let's take the environment, for example, in terms of, well, if this individual, the, the resident is becoming agitated, we would look at the environment. So for example, are there, is it maybe a loud noise? Maybe they're in the cafeteria and because of all the commotion that that might be spurring it. Um, is, is, is that kind of what you're, what you're referring to. Exactly. And and we would call that the fancy term overstimulation, right? And conversely, a lot of nursing homes you go to, it's understimulation, right? You know, I think we've all been into long-term care facilities and there's somebody cranked up in a jerry chair. They're all by themselves and they're yelling help, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point I went into one of those facilities, saw that. And, and what I sort of observed as I looked at that tableau was, all the nurses and staff were walking around and ignoring that person. So they're yelling help, they're in the chair, they're cranked up. And I sort of put myself in that person's place. And I thought if I was cranked up in this chair, something was going on with me and I'm yelling help and nobody's coming. <laughs> Probably because, you know, they're tuned out. They're like, oh, I this person's done it multiple times. Sure. Um, but, but it's sort of like, you know, the environment, you know, can, can, push to create more symptoms or exacerbate those symptoms. And that, that example I gave you just brings up another thing, which is that as people, you know, develop dementia, communication becomes very difficult. It's, it's like, you know, as your communication verbally diminishes, we have to look for communication in other ways. And so the person with dementia may be trying to communicate to us with that help. Something's wrong in the environment. Maybe they're hot. Um, maybe they're in pain. Uh, maybe, you know, they're hypoglycemic. They, they haven't had a snack in a while. You know, the behavior is actually communication. So if we turn around and say, we're going to give you a medication and sedate that, <laughs> you know, really just a friend of mine in England calls it magic sleepy bye-bye dust, you know, <laughs> like to give you something to put you to sleep. Sure. You know, we're really kind of silencing that communication. And at a human level, that's that's kind of sad. Let me let's let me um, let me approach it this way, then. So you mentioned we 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 should have person centered care. And of course, that's actually on the regulations like th that should be occurring is that we 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 look at everybody as an individual. But talk talk to me about then the idea of if an individual is admitted to a, a, a nursing home, 
they have a diagnosis of dementia and they have a history of agitation, they have a history of, of perhaps wandering or, or, or aggression, what's the next step? Like what should, what, what, what do you think the, the, the facility should be doing on day one to address those issues in a non-pharmaceutical way if possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so first of all, I'd say we need to get, you know, the terms precision medicine and, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get more precise with medicine in, in my field now. And yet in this area and dementia care, we're awfully unprecise, right? So again, when somebody says agitation, I quite simply don't know what that means. That could be anything from somebody who is, you know, bouncing their feet up and down to, actually striking somebody to verbally aggressive. So our first step, and we we call it the DICE approach, the D stands for describe, right? So we want to get a full description of what is that most problem behavior that we're looking at and play it back for us like a scene in a movie, get as precise as possible, like the who, what, why, when, where. Um, and you know that can get down to uh, Anna when we go to do her, activities of daily living is cursing and pushing at caregivers and, um, you know, striking out. And as part of that described step, we also try to say, is anyone actually in danger when that's happening? Because if somebody's in danger, that's going to push us one way or another. And so in this case, you know, let's say Anna's a 90 pound woman. No, we're not afraid for our safety. So again, that's not going to push me into any kind of like medication intervention. So then in, in the next step, D-I-C-E, I is investigate. We're gonna investigate, is this a new behavior? Is this an old behavior? Is this something sudden? If it's something new, we're gonna worry about maybe something medical is going on, You know, maybe a delirium, where she came from, did they start a new medication? Has the dose changed? Um, is she on anything anticholinergic like, Tylenol PM or Ditropan that would be making her more confused. So we're going to look at all that. We're going to look at any medical conditions that should be could be kicking up. Is she in pain? So sometimes when people go to do ADLs, they may inadvertently pull somebody towards something and maybe, you know, there's something in her arm that hurts or some arthritis. We want to look into all of that. We want to look into the caregiver interaction. So is there a lot of times um, people inadvertently may not have the best communication with people with dementia. So there have been studies that have found that when people have a negative tone, they raise their voices or they're like, you always do this. Now, come on. Uh, that escalates behavior, actually. And so we want to maybe look at that communication. And then that other piece, which is the environment, when they're trying to get Anna to do these ADLs, is there something going on in the environment? Like they're trying to get her to the bath, but it's cold in there, or they don't have her favorite soap, or, you know, we could be doing a sponge bath, you know, all those kind of things. And so then in that C step of DICE, we would be thinking about, okay, what did we find out? Okay, she's got some arthritis. Maybe can, we can pre-medicate her with some Tylenol. Her family told us that this is her favorite soap. Um, she may be a little hypoglycemic, so maybe have a, a snack on hand. But you sort of see we, we're kind of coming at it from all these non-pharmacologic angles rather than saying, uh, let's give her Risperdal 0.5, you know, before the bath to sedate her. And then in the E step of DICE, what we're doing is, hey, how did that work? Did, did any of those interventions give us any purchase? If so, let's keep them going. If not, let's keep brainstorming. And so it's really person-centered and it's also centered to where the person is at that point in time, the situation. That's fantastic. There's a lot to unpack there. I want to go back to the, to the D in DICE. And we'll talk about DICE here in a second. I'm, I'm super interested in it in terms of where it came from, how it's being implemented. But continuity of care is obviously super important between shifts, between days. And what I hear you say, which is so interesting, in the D of describe is to be granular because we could be, as you mentioned, as you pointed out to me, that aggression could mean anything. So rather than 
jot down in the nurse note aggression, you jot down, what was it? Well, they threw their cup across the room or um, they scratched at the person next to them. That's, I would, I would imagine down the line when you're trying to understand the interventions that you need to do would be more helpful because it might not be aggression, right? Because you mentioned it could be, it, it, it could be a, a host of other things other than the intention to inflict pain on somebody. Um, so I, that, that really struck me. That's, that's, um, that's a great, um, the, well, one thing I wanted to point to that I wanted to discuss really quickly before we talk about dice as a program, um, was it seems to me, and I don't know if this might be your experience in, in your research and your studies and your experience, perhaps when someone has dementia in the nursing home, the nursing home really, I'm not saying this from a malicious standpoint but perhaps they're only worried about a certain set of symptoms. So as you mentioned, someone with dementia might be apathetic and just sitting and looking at the wall. They need as many interventions as the person that is actually getting up and, and throwing cups across the room and things like that. Like, can you speak to that? Like, do you see? Absolutely. I, you know, it's funny um, when I did more work in the hospital, we would observe that people who were apathetic or had what we call a hypoactive delirium. So they, they were confused. They were, they were completely confused, but they were quietly confused nursing. And again, I think nurses are the best. I I'm not being pejorative uh, toward them at all. Those patients would tend to get overlooked because they were quiet and they weren't, you know, causing any trouble. The people that would get a lot of attention were the people who were very agitated or they were psychotic, you know, they were in their delirium, they were seeing or hearing things. And as you say, sometimes the people who were quietly in the chair were some of the sickest people, but weren't getting that attention because the behavior looked like it fit in better, maybe. Right, um, non-problematic to, to, to the people taking care, yeah. Going with the flow, so to speak. And I think that's sort of a theme that I think I would love to see change, you know, in our nursing homes, which is how do we bypass the sense of going with the flow for the sake of structure and hierarchy and the way nursing homes work and really making nursing homes more person-centered such that we are actually, because I think what ends up happening in the former is you think you're imposing structure and you think you're, you know, very linear A to B, but by not allowing some of our frontline folks to think outside the box and say, oh gosh, I know that, you know, Mr. Smith was a gardener and that may be why he's trying to wander outside at lunchtime because he's trying to get to our plants, you know, we don't we don't brainstorm solutions that instead could be not only help the person with their symptoms but actually breed more contentment within our staff because they would feel more you know like gosh i know something about this person and i'm empowered to actually help in this situation rather than call somebody like me for a medication right so tell me then tell me about Tell me about DICE from a broad standpoint. Like, wh when was it developed? Like, who, when you said we, like, who's we? Uh, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell so, us about So, DICE, uh, we began to develop device, DICE in 2011. The we is myself and Laura Gitlin, who is actually a sociologist by training. And we were kind of coming together from the medical and the behavioral perspectives and saying, you know, we're seeing this. And we're seeing that, you know, people use a lot of medications. We know that at the time there were black box warnings coming out with antipsychotics. We were concerned that there was, you know, even mortality associated with these medications and a lot of side effects. And what were we really doing? You know, what were we, how were we really treating people? You know, and I was, I would Give us an example, you know, we have the movement in child psychiatry with people with autism. We've come so far in that movement where there's similar difficulty with communication. And my own health system, for example, has developed, you know, blood drawing stations and imaging that is autism friendly, right? 
we haven't done the same kind of thing with dementia. We sort of, why are these patients acting like this? We need to medicate them. They're not doing that as much in autism because autism has this advocacy community that have really kind of risen up and saying, this isn't good care. And so we kind of got together and say, how could we really bring together more of an approach that would unpack these symptoms for people, sort of show them the way in a simplified, you know, mnemonic to really create learning patterns, but also behavioral change in the actual provider to say, oh yeah, I need to look for pain. I need to make sure I look for delirium. I need to make sure I look for changes in medication. And so we got a, a group of national experts together actually across specialties to endorse this approach, to flesh it out. And then we published it in a national journal in 2014. From there, it's taken off. It's now used nationally and internationally. We have a training website that we're in the process of making free for providers, caregivers, anybody. And we've really taken the trainings to the caregivers themselves because we've kind of realized that primary care providers are overburdened and it's it's probably not there where we're going to get a lot of traction. We're going to have to work either with frontline staff or frontline caregivers. And so we now have over about 600 subscriptions nationally to our website. Um, we've done live trainings with hundreds of people and shown that that really impacts their confidence in handling symptoms. I think a lot of this is really education. When somebody gets diagnosed with dementia, often what happens in this country is you're kind of given this diagnosis and maybe somebody gets a brochure or like, oh, you could call the Alzheimer's Association. Right. They, they have a number, um, but that's it. And we've been told by caregivers, I never knew that dad was going to hallucinate. I was never told that, you know, I think people's picture of dementia sometimes is a person sitting in a chair kind of quietly forgetting, and they don't realize that a lot of these behaviors that come up are really a huge part of the process. Walk me through, th this is from from the from the provider standpoint, from the, the LPN, the RN, this even to the CNA, how are they taking, how are they able to physically get dice and run through it over the six or seven or eight days of, of after admission or whatever to get the information they need to make the person-centered assessment? Like walk me through, is it like, kind of like the Braden scale where you're given characteristics that assign a, a numeric value and based on the numeric value, or is it a decision tree? Walk, walk me through how Dice yeah, it's actually. a little more loose and qualitative than that, but it's more of the thinking process, I would say, kind of like almost like unpacking the scientific method, you know, like we we basically often people will jump to a solution similar to much of life before they understand the problem. Right. Like, oh, I know what to do. I'm going to do this. And we always train our, our you know, trainees no description is the first task that full full description and often our lpns lvns uh social workers you know cnas they're really good at this because they know the most about the patient um you know they're going to be the ones to say oh i know joe was actually a, a, a reverend in his former life and he's actually really religious or you know, Gemma uh, is from Italy and she really loves talking about, you know, the Pope and Italian cooking, you know, so that those are gems in this approach, because knowing what somebody's likes and dislikes and who they were in their former life, I think, Rob, that's something that's also often missed in, in long term care is mm -hmm. we see that person in the bed or in the chair and we sort of think they've always been that way. Right. And having that, that light shown and and knowing, talking to the family and getting that history and that, that background on them can often help us in thinking about when we go down through DICE and get toward the creative solutions, you know, what are some things that this person, so activity, we often use it as a, as a creative solution Unfortunately, in most nursing homes, if you've gone to them, you see that activities like one size fits all. We send people to a group and they sing a song 
And I don't know about you, but my musical taste is pretty specific. And if I was older and if somebody put me in a group and said, you are going to sing this song, you know, you think about it. It, it, it just because they're 80 doesn't mean they like that song. So thinking about what does somebody like to do in their past or now, and also what is possible for them to do. So that's, that's another piece. We always give the example from Dr. Gitlin's work of somebody who was a fisherman. Okay, he can no longer fish, but as an activity, could he organize a tackle box with the hooks taken out? Right. You know, that might be really fun for him. Or even at a more advanced stage, could he watch a fishing video? Just kind of using what you know about that person to, and it doesn't really even take that long. It's just that extra step. Um, and you do see this in some nursing homes where they do have, you know, as you walk in, they have sort of memory boxes. There are things that give you a hint as to who that person was. And what we do is we encourage facilities to do that more, you know, have something at the bedside where they talk about what Marie likes and doesn't like so that the new shift coming on can kind of know she doesn't like being grabbed by the arm. Um, or or surprised, you know, she likes maybe a gentle touch on her foot, you know, things like that. What I mean, it's it sounds pretty comprehensive, Dice. What do you think, it, it, especially with with respect to the, I think it was the C, the implementation, the creation of the intervention. Yes. What do you think the biggest conflict or friction is for nursing homes to implement that part? Like, where, where in in your experience, like, where are you seeing? trouble with 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 the implementation i think it's buy-in from the hierarchy i think it you know places that i have worked with where the hierarchy has bought into it and has said have you ever been to disney and they <clears throat> they my understanding is they they've told their staff the customers first if something's going on you can take a minute and sit down with them and figure it out that would be the kind of mentality you would want the hierarchy to have, right? Like if somebody, you know, we know a lot in a lot of these places, the frontline staff are serving food, doing medications, answering a beeper. They may also have a phone on their belt. You know, there's all these kind of things going on. So simplifying that so that the person is available to sit down for five minutes with that person and actually kind of run through dice in their head. Right. Um, could actually save a lot of time in the long run. Um, and that's what we've tried to show hierarchy when we've worked with facilities is that, you know, a lot of this sort of revolving door, sending people to EDs because they've escalated, um, you can actually prevent with a little time up front. And so allowing the staff who know the most about the patients to spend the time with them and decode the behavior actually can save a lot of time later. So well said. That is fantastic. Dr. Kells, this has been extremely educational. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. It's been delightful to talk with you, Rob. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the substance of this episode. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. We're everywhere, I think. We're on Spotify. We're on Google, um, Apple Podcasts, if that even still exists. Um, on YouTube. Check us out. If you have suggestions for content, if you have some topics that you would like for me to cover or guests that you want to have, uh, you want me to talk to on the show, be sure to leave us a comment. Let us know. Um, willing to talk to anybody if it relates to nursing home safety. Um, and with that, folks, we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal or medical advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes for now are available every other Monday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.